Every leap of civilization was built off the back of a disposable workforce. We lost our stomach for slaves, unless engineered. But I can only make so many. Am I the only one that can see the sunrise here? This breaks the world, Kay. I had the lock. I found the key. Yet the pins do not align. The door remains locked. I need the specimen to reach it. Because you've never seen a miracle. Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're talking about shadow masks, or honestly, more often called a stencil by normal people outside of academia. A shadow mask is a way to put a pattern onto any kind of substrate, just like a, a spray paint stencil. Say you have a piece of glass and you'd like to put some kind of micro electrode array onto the glass. How would you go about doing that? So you could deposit the metal exactly where you want it using something like the laser copper deposition that we saw in an earlier video, but honestly that's a really finicky process and it's slow and it only works for certain metals, so that's just not really a method that's used anywhere in industry or academia. Much more common method is to use photolithography, and photolithography is essentially the same process as when you're etching a PCB. You put down a photoresist that's sensitive to ultraviolet light, you expose some kind of pattern onto the photoresist, develop it and wash away the uncured photoresist, and you're left with a temporary pattern on your substrate, and from there you can etch the PCB. Or if you were working with glass slides, you can deposit your metal through the exposed regions. And photolithography is great, it's used pretty much everywhere. All of the semiconductor industry is built on photolithography. Photolithography often adds a lot of steps to your process. You need to put the photoresist on and make sure it's a nice, even, continuous coat. You sometimes have to do kind of a soft bake before you expose it, then you expose it, wash away all the undeveloped photoresist, deposit your metal through it, and then typically you strip the photoresist at the end. So it's a lot of extra moving steps and you need to do that each time you add a new layer for whatever you're building. And you can think about photoresist essentially being a single use stencil, right? You make a stencil temporarily on the substrate using that photoresist. But instead of going through the whole process of photolithography, you can just make a stencil directly and use the stencil to deposit your pattern of choice. This has a number of speed advantages. The stencil you just drop on and deposit, there's no exposing a photoresist, curing, washing, developing, you know, that whole process is skipped. The shadow masks are reusable, so as long as the features that you're depositing metal through don't fill up, you can continue using this mask as long as you want. They're often pretty quick to make, and they're cheap and easy. Okay, cool, let's make a shadow mask. So, ironically, shadow masks are typically made using photolithography in the industry. Rather than patterning a substrate and depositing through the pattern, they pattern something like thin metal and then etch through it using acids or electro etching, something like that. Now, we're not going to do that because, frankly, I started this project because I don't have a good lithography setup yet and I wanted to make some small features. Using lithography to make a shadow mask to avoid lithography doesn't really make sense. But I do have a fiber laser and it cuts metal pretty well, especially if it's thin. So I was curious to see what kind of resolution I could get out of just the off the shelf laser and some very thin metal. My material of choice is this one thou shim stock. It's about 25 microns for the metric world. I believe this is 1008 cold roll steel. It's magnetic, which we'll see in a bit is very important. This material was chosen for a couple of reasons. The fiber laser can cut through relatively thick material, but it takes a lot of passes to do that. And the more passes you take on a material, the more heat builds up. The fiber lasers have a pulse duration of about 100 nanoseconds, which sounds pretty short. And I mean, it is in the scheme of things, but to a metal substrate, 100 nanoseconds is actually a very long time. And it's a long enough amount of time that the energy from the laser pulse can diffuse into kind of the bulk substrate. And that diffusion of energy is basically heating. And when you're dealing with small metals like this, the heat causes a lot of warpage at that location. And so I tried some thicker materials, something like 30, 40 thou, uh, larger foils, and you can cut it fine, but the warping is totally unacceptable. And that's mainly because you need to take 10, 15 passes to get through the material. 
So the thinner material you can get, the better, but there is a limit because at some point the metal just becomes too insubstantial to even support itself. So I did try some of this really thin imitation silver leaf material that you use this for like gilding artworks and stuff like that. Um, the imitation silver is actually just aluminum that's been pounded out very thinly, but it is so thin that it, it just like flakes apart as soon as you touch it. And it is completely insubstantial and, and won't hold its shape once it's off the backing paper. I think this stuff is a couple microns thick and it's just way too thin to be useful. So I found the one thou shim stock was kind of the best trade off between mechanical stability and thin enough that you can cut it in a single pass or a couple passes as we'll see. So there are a couple knobs you can play with on a fiber laser to adjust how much energy is delivered to a specific location in a specific amount of time. You can change the power of the laser, how quickly it's scanning, how frequently the pulses are delivered, and then also how long of a focal length of lens you're using, which affects essentially the spot size of the laser itself. So for example, you could decrease the pulse frequency or speed up the laser to deliver fewer pulses per point, but those have subtly different effects. If you speed up, you're delivering the same amount of energy per pulse, they're just spaced out a little further. But if you decrease the pulse frequency, what you're actually doing is putting more energy into each individual pulse, and they just happen less frequently. And so for this application, what we want to do is deliver a very large amount of energy quickly to one location and then move on to the next spot. And so ideally you want a lower pulse frequency. I found 20 kilohertz was pretty good and a reasonably quick rate of moving with as low of power as possible. So I found 20 to 30% power, 100 millimeters a second and 20 kilohertz was pretty good. And that was enough to give you a clean ablation path through the metal in a single pass without too much warpage. I also used a magnetic fixture to help keep the shim stock flat against a glass slide. And this basically serves to flatten out the natural curvature to the shim stock, as well as reducing a little bit of the warpage as it's being scanned. I'm sure these aren't optimal settings, but they seem to give a pretty decent result. And if we look at it under the microscope, you can see that the line widths are about four to five, up to maybe 10 or so microns, depending on where you look. There's a bit of a trade-off. The thinner the line width, the more likely you are to have kind of bridging artifacts where a little piece doesn't get fully ablated. And then to clear those out, it tends to enlarge the line a little bit. So yeah, four or five microns, like I'm not at all mad about that. That's a pretty respectable resolution for how fast and easy this process is. Now sure, it's not the smallest feature size but it's perfectly sufficient if you're wanting to make like large electrodes or something like that. Now, of course, once you have this mask, you actually have to put it to use and that process is relatively straightforward. We take our mask of choice, set it down on a glass slide or whatever substrate you want. I used a little bit of Captain tape just to hold it loosely in place before it goes in the sputter machine on top of a special magnetic fixture. And this is really just a piece of magnetic metal that's taped to the stage of my sputter coater and it has a array of magnets on top of it which help hold down the slide and the mask in place. This is really important for getting a good clean crisp deposition of metal because any space between the mask and the substrate will make the line be more diffuse because there's more area for the deposition to kind of spread out. So ideally you want the mask perfectly flat against the substrate. But the trick is you can't use something like an adhesive because that would get in the way of the thing you're trying to deposit. So if you had a more substantial mask, like something that had some heft to it, you can just hold it in place. But because the shim stock is so thin and has some natural curves to it, that doesn't actually work and you'll get bowing in the middle. If you look closely, you can actually see regions where the plasma is being distorted by those magnets. And so this will affect the deposition to a small degree because the magnetic field is actually changing where those sputtered particles are going. But I didn't really see any difference. There's no major regions that were under or over deposited. And there's a few papers on this subject and they came to similar conclusions where it affects it a little bit, but it's not enough to worry about. And the beauty of shadow masks is that once your first layer is done, you just pull off the mask, slap the next mask on top, repeat the process, and you're good to go. So to demonstrate this, I built a fake little transistor layout. The bottom layer is in copper, and 
you can see the source and the drain kind of electrodes coming to meet in the middle. On top of that is a square of aluminum, which is supposed to be acting like the dielectric or semiconductor layer in a thin film transistor. And then finally on top of that is a copper layer acting as the fake gate. This is all manually aligned and so there is some alignment error. I was just doing it under the microscope. You could envision much better fixturing ways to actually align this well and get better precision. But despite doing this by hand, I was kind of shocked how, how easily you can align things by eye. Now obviously this is kind of at the limits of it and there's a lot of skew, so you can only align one feature at a time reliably this way. But doing it by hand for a single thing, it's not out of the question. Now I should note there are some big downsides to using shadow masks or micro stencils. Resolution that you get out of a stencil is just a lot less than any type of photolithography method, especially modern versions. And that's really why the industry has stopped using this for the most part, is that the resolution is pretty limited by the material that you're etching or, in our case, ablating through. The metal stencil that you're etching can only support features that are so small before the metal substrate itself just kind of starts to fall apart, or it's so thin that there's no support and the features start getting wavy. One of the advantages of a shadow mask is being able to reuse it, but that also represents a disadvantage over time as well. So because you can reuse it, and typically you're depositing metal through the shadow mask, the metal is being deposited on the mask itself. And so over time, the features that you've etched or ablated will start to close in because the metal is filling them in. And so over time, your features will actually change in size and might completely close over, which is obviously not great. One of the other big disadvantages of using a stencil is that you need to have that intimate contact between the shadow mask and the substrate. And that can be difficult, especially as you get to larger masks, but the magnet system sort of helps alleviate that. But the other big problem is that the mask, if it's physically touching your substrate, that means it's touching prior layers. And there's a pretty high risk that you can start to scratch up the layers you deposited previously. If you're careful, I found that this wasn't too bad, but you can definitely start to see some scratching of the prior layers, especially if you need to reposition the shadow mask a few times. And lastly, probably the biggest disadvantage to a shadow mask is that there's a limit to the types of geometry you can deposit in a single pass. So imagine wanting to deposit like a donut shape where you've got a ring and then you've got a hole in the middle that's filled in and the outside's filled in. You can't do that with a stencil, right? You just you just can't because the, the center region of the donut needs to be attached to the edges. So you'd have to have some type of attachment lines. And that's why you see stencils that have little bars that are connecting letters. So to do that with a shadow mask, you'd actually have to do two separate masks, one with the center region and one with the outer region. And then you'd have to very precisely line things up. And so your nice, simple system starts to become a little more complicated. But if your geometry works with a stencil layout and you don't have any isolated islands, then it's a really fast and easy process. And it's definitely something I'll be using more in the future. If you like this garage microfab sort of stuff, you're in luck, because I do too. I think it's really fascinating. And my next video will be showcasing a really cool machine to help with these projects. I managed to get a hold of an atomic force microscope, which will be really helpful in characterizing kind of the critical dimensions of a lot of these features. So if you're not subscribed already and that sounds interesting, definitely subscribe. The next video on AFM is going to be really cool in my opinion. And if you're already subscribed and not on the Discord server, you should really join. It's a super cool place. There's tons of people working on cool projects and yeah, come hang out. Okay. Well, I think that's all I got for you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.